Does the client or RIA pay the trade-in transaction cost? That is today's question on the Transition to RIA video series. This is question number 15. Hi, I'm Brad Wales with Transition to RIA, and today's question is, does the client or the RIA pay the trade-in transaction cost? Now, I'll start this video by pointing out my answer to this question uh, today is, is quite a bit different than, than had I made this video a year ago or prior, and I'm going to explain what that, why that is, but the, but the world has fundamentally changed as far as transaction goes, costs go in this, in this past year. So uh, if, if you've last asked this question or been told an answer, you know, roughly a year ago or, or prior, the things have definitely changed. And, and so this video addresses kind of the new world environment that we're in. And, and so I'll, I'll start by saying, okay, so what, what is a transaction trading cost or when does it occur? And, and let's, let's start by what it, what it was a year or so prior, and then, and then we'll kind of look at how it's changed now. So up until about a year ago, Every time you would place a trade in a client's account, the custodian that you use to hold that client's assets and, and facilitate the trades uh, would charge a transaction cost. And that was on every equity trade, on every ETF trade, on every option trade, mutual fund trade. Um, so every time you did a, a rebalance or you just adjusted an account, um, every time there was a buy or sell, generally there, is a, there was a transaction cost on that buy and on that sell. And so as an example, on, a, on an equity trade back in the day, you, you used to maybe pay and it, and it varied for, for a couple of different variables or, or reasons, uh, but perhaps your uh, transaction cost that you had with your custodian uh, called for an, an, a $7 transaction charge on every equity trade you did. And so every time you bought or sold an equity, it was, it was $7 on the sell, $7 on the buy. Uh, mutual funds have different uh, transaction charge price and options do. Um, and ETFs were usually lumped in in the same price and with, with equities. Um, but, but kind of fast forward to now, the, the world has changed, at least with respect to some of that. And so uh, a number of custodians came out and said, hey, we are going to reduce the equity ETF piece down, down to zero. Um, and then once, once the, kind of that, the proverbial dam broke, then the number of other custodians fell in line. And, and uh, so most large custodians, not, not all custodians, but most large custodians now have kind of similar pricing on that zero. And so nowadays, if you were to work with one of the larger custodians, you generally will not pay a transaction cost for at least equities and ETFs. I'll, I'll talk about the other products. So every time you do a buy or sell, what, what used to maybe cost $7 or $8 is, is now zero. Um, and, and, and that's, again, that's kind of the industry norm nowadays. And that, that is a fundamental change from, from what it was for, from, from a long time ago. Now, with that, let me, let me still point out that, you know, the, the headlines that came out around this was, was transaction costs, trading costs have gone to zero. And, and with respect to equities and ETFs, that is absolutely accurate. Again, assuming you're, you're working with one of these custodians that, that, that kind of fell in line with that trend. Um, however, it, it is not to imply that, that all transaction costs went to zero. Again, equities and ETFs went to zero, but generally speaking, all custodians still charge transaction charges on, among, among other things, mutual funds. Now, there's a, there's a way to maybe avoid that transaction charge with respect to mutual funds, I'll touch on in just a second. Um, but option trades usually have some sort of component to it. Maybe there's no flat amount up front, but there generally still is a per contract charge that goes on that. Uh, fixed income trades usually still have a transaction charge. So um, the, the point of that is to say, transaction charges still exist it, with, with certain kind of uh, uh, trade in products or, or investment products. With equities and ETFs, generally no, but again, mutual funds, fixed income options, there, there generally still is a transaction cost there. And, and so that, that's part of what we're talking about here today is, again, well, who, who pays that transaction cost? Um, but before I get into that, I, I did want to note a, a couple ways to, to further, in theory, avoid these transaction costs that do still exist. Uh, so one way with respect to mutual funds and to a degree at some firms still ETFs, um, that have not done on some firms have not gone to zero on, on ETFs, but let's, let's, let's start with mutual funds because this is pretty uniform throughout all custodial options that, that generally speaking by default, a, a mutual fund has a transaction charge. However, 
if a particular mutual fund you desire to use is on the company's NTF list or no transaction fee list, uh, like I said, a lot of firms refer to them as an NTF list. If the mutual fund you desire to use is on that list, then there will, there will be no transaction charge with that. It, it will be zero on the buy and will be zero on the sell. And, and I would tell you from the, the whole mutual fund universe that's out there, you know, give, give or take about 80 to 90% of, of mutual funds are generally on those NTF lists. So there, the, the point is there, is, there is the chance that you will have to incur transaction charges on mutual fund trades. But, but in most cases, again, depends on the fund families you use. In most cases, they could be followed on this NTF list and, and it might, might be zero after all. But, but just know there is that reality that there, there could be transaction charges on, on some subset of those mutual funds. Um, and then for, for some custodians that are still charging uh, transaction charge on ETF uh, trades, some of those firms also have a, have a NTF ETF list. So, hey, as long as you use these ETFs on this list, it will be at no transaction charge. Um, and, and so, again, that's, that's not as prevalent as the mutual fund situation because, again, most custodians just have gone to zero altogether on, on, on ETFs. So it's, so it's not really an issue, but just, but just know that the NTF concept, it's in some occurrences, does apply to that, that ETF uh, platform as well. Uh, and so the, the last thing I'd say on, on, on how these charges can kind of, I don't want to say be avoided, but, but how, they, how they're priced is uh, most custodians will also offer an option called, uh, often referred to as asset-based pricing, ABP. So that is, a, as opposed to saying everything I've just described, which is often referred to as transaction-based pricing, which is, okay, on a, on a per-trade basis, uh, what, what is the transaction cost going to be? And maybe it's zero, like we talked about, or maybe there is that fee. Um, the idea with asset-based pricing is, hey, I, I as an advisor don't want my clients to see any transaction charges, e even if it's only a subset of mutual funds and even if it's only you know, the, the few option trades I maybe do or the, the, the few fixed income trades, I, I don't want any transaction charges. And so that's the idea of asset-based pricing. And, I, and I'll do a whole separate video on transaction-based pricing versus asset-based pricing. But in and I, so I don't want to dive too deep into this one, but in, in concept, the idea is as opposed to paying these individual transaction charges on each, each time a trade is done, instead, there's just a, a basis point charge to the account. Um, you know, maybe it's three basis points and for that, it's effectively unlimited trade in with, with no transaction charges. So you might hear that again, asset-based pricing. I'll do a whole separate video on the pros and cons of transaction-based pricing versus asset-based pricing. Uh, but I, I did want to just point out that that is, in theory, an additional way to eliminate these transaction charges. So the, the question is, and on today's video, we're talking about, okay, if you are going to use this transaction-based pricing uh, arrangement, and, and yes, most of your trades might go at zero, but, the, but there still could be some, some that don't uh, or, or do have a fee. So the question is, who pays for that? And, and generally speaking, uh, by default, it goes to the client. It is charged to the client's account. Um, and, and there's a host of reasons that's, that's arguably better than, than the alternative, which I'll touch on. And, and the reason is because as an advisor, you know, there's, uh, you, you, of course, in an RIA environment, a fee-only environment, when, you, when you're solely under the, 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 the RIA umbrella, you are not receiving commissions for anything. You are solely receiving your advisory fee that you charge your client. And, and, and if you've had a client for a long time, and maybe there was a time that you, you did work in a commission capacity with them, you know, they're familiar with the idea that, oh, every time a trade was done and a commission was generated, that, that that is part how you were compensated. And so if you do, you know, for instance, have clients that have been with you through kind of both of those cycles of how pricing and, and, and commissions versus fees was occurring, um, you know, now all of a sudden, if you start your own RA and you're with a custodian and, and your client sees these transaction charges, you, they, they might be confused because they say, well, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Visor, you're, you're telling me that the only fee you receive is the, is the, uh, the fee I pay you, the advisory fee, the maybe the 1%, and, and, and beyond that, you're, you're neutral. And the reality is you are neutral, and, you, and that is the only fee you receive. Of that transaction charge, you as the RA do not receive any of that. That is 100% retained by the custodian. That's one of the ways a custodian generates revenue. Um, and so to the degree your client sees that, you wanna make that very clear. Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Client, just so you know, this is, this is how 
a custodial arrangement works. And in some instances, there could be these transaction charges. And just know, Mr. and Mrs. Klein, myself as the RIA received none of that. That is, that is entirely retained by the custodian to facilitate that trade and to send your confirmation into, into custody of those assets. Um, and so it's, the, the, the reason I say this is because it's, it's, once you explain, it's very transparent to the client. Client, I, I received none of that. So it's, it's actually in your best interest that, that you pay it because again, there's no conflict. So if I go into your account and feel that it's appropriate to do a rebalance or it's appropriate to, to, to sell one position and buy another position, just know that I as the RA am not benefiting from that transaction at all. I'm doing it solely because I think it's in your best interest to make that trade at this time. So that transaction charge you see does not impact me at all. That is retained solely by the custodian. So again, by default, most custodians set up accounts that it, that it just defaults to the client to pay this. Now, some advisors and RIAs you know, are sensitive to that or they, or they don't want the client to, to, to see it or to pay it or they don't wanna have that conversation. And so there generally is the ability to in turn instruct the custodian, uh, custodian instead of charging the client, charge that transaction charge to, to me as the RIA. And that is, that is very doable. Uh, the regulations allow that. There's, there's a number of disclosure things that need to come out with it. Uh, and the, the, but there are challenges to that. And I'm, and, I, and I'm not indicating that one way is necessarily right and one way is necessarily wrong, but keep in mind there, there is that uh, uh, kind of an inherent conflict of interest that if you elect to do that as an RIA, that the challenge with that though, and, and whether or not you, know, you, you would ever uh, maliciously make a decision based on this or not is one thing, as long as there's the perception you know, is that something you just want to avoid altogether? And, and by, by what I mean by that is if you, the RIA, absorb in these transaction charges, and so let's say you use mutual funds that, that, that are not on that NTF list and there is that transaction charge, and maybe all other things equal, the, the, you decide that you should do a number of trades and client accounts, or it's, or it's a quarterly rebalance. Maybe you rebalance on a quarterly cycle. Well, if you're absorbing all those transaction charges, every time you decide to make that transaction or make that trade, that's a big expense, possibly thousands of dollars, depends on the number of accounts involved, that, that's pushed back to you as an RA. And so again, it, it creates at a minimum a perception of a conflict of interest that, you know, arguably, could you say, wow, it's, uh, you know, maybe we should rebalance, but maybe the accounts actually aren't that far out of out of our, our target ranges. And if, and if I rebalance, it's going to cost me X thousands of dollars. And, and so maybe we're okay just leaving them as, are, as they are for another quarter. And, and I'm of the opinion, you just generally want to try to avoid that, that uh, conflict, whether from your own you know, personal way of, of having to, to, to run the accounts, but, but more so just for the client. So you can cleanly say, client, I, it doesn't make any difference to me whether we do one trade or a hundred trades. I'm paid the 1% fee or whatever the fee is from you. And, and I received none of these transaction charges. So that's, I mean, that's my, my personal opinion, but, but I would tell you, there are a number of advisors that, that do it um, and it's perfectly fine. And, and sometimes the justification is, you know, uh, hey, 98% of the trades I do are, are at zero anyways, because they're equities or ETFs or they are on that NTF list. And there's only a small number of mutual fund trades that occur that, that are not on this NTF list. And it's just easier for me to absorb those than, than having to have that conversation with clients. And it's such a de minimis amount of money that it's, you know, I, I'm comfortable that no one would think I'm conflicted and whether I want to absorb that amount each time it occurs. So uh, pros and cons to each, just know it, it generally is possible to do both. And, and generally the, 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 uh, the default is to go to the client uh, or, uh, the, the RA has the ability to absorb it. And like I said, one way to, to, to try to further avoid that is, is to the degree you can and desire to, is to look at those NTF lists. So I've, I've talked to many, uh, many RAs that uh, you know, say, hey, I, I do use mutual funds, I make models, uh, but I generally aim to choose which mutual funds to use from that NTF list. And again, it's, it's the bulk of the NTFs, or the, sorry, the mutual funds that are, that are out there available for you to use. And, and so if you build models that are entirely comprised of, of, of mutual funds that are on this NTF mutual fund list, then, then this whole issue is a, a moot point. There is no transaction charge. You don't even need to worry about asset-based pricing. You don't need to worry about absorbing the fees. Um, 
and, and so that is another strategy as well. It's just to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to purposely try to fall within these, these NTF lists. Uh, and like I said, again, this, this idea of asset based pricing is, is something to consider as well. Uh, because in theory, it, it eliminates all of this conversation, albeit it does then introduce that, you know, perhaps 3% fee. And again, the, the question is, well, who would absorb that? Would that be the decline or the RIA? And, and that perhaps has a, 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 a little less conflicts because if it is just a flat free basis points, whether you trade one time or a hundred times, um, you know, then there's, there's no uh, conflict of, of should I do this rebalance this month or not? If it's, if it's always going to be the same, you know, perhaps three basis points. Um, so to, to, to wrap up on that, uh, the point is there's, there's pros and cons to all of this. Well, you know, it's not to say that one for sure is the better path than another. Um, and and it's, it's mostly just a dialogue with the client, helping them understand, okay, here, here's how the RIA and custodial world operates. Here's how I'm paid as the RIA. Here's how a custodian generates revenue to cover the cost of holding your assets, clearing trades, sending you confirmations. And, and generally, I've, I've found RIAs have no problem with this. Once they explain it to the clients, the clients understand how it works. And it's, it's not, a, not a big deal at all. Um, but I think it is important, and that's why I wanted to make this video, that, that you do understand when transaction charges still to this day exist, like I said, a lot of it has gone away, but they still exist in some capacity. And then the question is, you know, who actually pays for it and what are those options? So with that, I'm Brad Wales with Transition to RA, and what I try to do is help advisors just like you understand everything there is to know about why and how to transition to the RA model. Uh, so today's topic is a perfect example that, you know, how, how does this work in the RA model? If I were to move the RA model, how does trade and work? How does transaction fees work? And so I, I hope you found this to be helpful. Uh, and this is the exact sort of thing I do, again, with advisors. Uh, if you jump over to, if you're not already there, to transition to RIA.com, uh, you can see plenty more videos just like this one. I have some white papers as well. Uh, but the easiest thing is, is right there at the top of the website is a contact link. You can jump on there uh, instantly and uh, quickly schedule a time, exact time and date to discuss with me everything you want to know about the RIA model and, and of importance, how it would apply to your specific arrangement now. You know, what kind of firm are you at? What kind of affiliation model are you at? What kind of clients do you have? What do you want to do with your practice? And then, and then how would that look as an RA model? So I'm, I'm glad to have that conversation with you. We'll walk you through as many details as you want to learn about. So with that, I hope you found value in today's video and I'll see you on the next one.